morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone from all over the world. Um, we've had um, so many participants signing in from so many different countries. I think at least the last count was eight different countries. Um, thank you for taking the time to come today for this informal conversation on the EU AA Act Sustainability and its impacts on the Global South. We have an amazing lineup of um, reactors and speakers today to push forward this conversation on the potential effects of an EU law on um, a lot of every one of us involved here um, right now, especially on such a thing as pervasive as artificial intelligence. And without further ado, um, for the welcoming re remarks, we'd like to welcome um, the Dean of the School of Environmental Science and Management at the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, Dean Rico Angkong. Dean? Thank you very much. A very pleasant day to one and all. It is surely a pleasure to be with all of you today to tackle this very important development related to EU Artificial Intelligence Act. Across the globe, there has been a clamor for widened and for widened increase in maximization of AI, specifically its applications to all aspects of our lives. However, it is important to emphasize that what we need is a trustworthy AI. To achieve this is more what is required is more thinking on the how and what comprehensive rules must be in place for a given type of AI. In our session today, we wish to learn more how the EU AI Act could ensure the fundamental rights, democracy, the rule of law, and environmental sustainability are protected from high-risk high AI. On the other hand, we also understand that if used effectively, AI could become instrumental in boosting innovation. Therefore, balance is the key. Meaning, how do our institutions set the obligations of AI given its potential risks and level of impacts? I am positive that how Europe would advance on this respect would afford all of us for example, Developing Philippines, we need to learn more how maximizing its benefits and minimizing it, any can be made possible. In closing, we would really like to extend also our appreciation to the organizers of this event, particularly the AI Governance Working Group of Wageningen University in Netherlands. Um, special mention, I hope it's okay. Special mention goes, of course, to Attorney Chad Osorio, who is affiliated, of course, with UPLB but I'm proud to say that currently he's also one of our affiliate faculty members of the UPLB School of Environmental Science and Management, um, specifically in our Environmental Diplomacy and Negotiations PhD program. Again, here's wishing to a successful and worthwhile learning to one and all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dean, for those um, very warm, welcoming remarks. Um, and uh, thank you for having um, Sisam with us today. It's very important that we have the School of um, uh, Environmental Science and Management is here, especially to talk about sustainability and what it means um, in the context of the EU AI Act. So for today, what we're going to do now is do a little bit of expectation settings um, before we start. But first, before we start, I'd like to ask everyone to comment in the chat below their first name, you don't have to write down your full name, their social security number, I'm, I'm just joking, um, their first name and um, their favorite AI character in, um, their favorite AI character in fiction, AI or robot character. Wally. Okay, so you have David, whose favorite is Wally. Okay, that's a very good um uh, starting point. Baymax. Okay, Baymax is super cute. Um, that's a uh, okay from both Al and Justin. How about the other ones? Jarvis. Okay, from this is from Iron Man, right? Jarvis is from Iron Man. Yes. And how about the other ones? We we do we only have three AI characters? Okay, Wally. Data. Who is Data, Jani? Data from where? Hmm. 
Vicky. Okay, I'm trying to remember who Vicky. Vicky is this is Vicky the one from uh Predator, the one who kills uh the one who kills all the humans. Okay, this is starting to be a very good conference now, right? iRobot. Ah, from iRobot. Okay, okay. Okay, a ah, data's from Star Trek. Okay. All right, Android 17. Okay, so from Dragon Ball. So the anime fans here. Okay, so it's okay. We're going to see all of these names and um later. Um so someone said David as well. So just to introduce myself, I'm Chad. My favorite um AI character would probably be um probably Bim Max as well because I like um I like you know fluffy cuddly things. Um and what we're gonna do today is go discuss the salient provisions of the proposed law, basically it the EU AI Act. Um we're not gonna relate them to fictional characters, we're gonna relate them to real life. Um, and what we're going to do now is we're going to ask people from different fields and perspectives to give their take on how the EU AI Act can affect, number one, sustainability, and number two, the global south. So um, these are both very important things to consider because any law does not exist in a vacuum. Every law affects every other law. Every topic affects every other topic. And just so we want to be clear on the expectations, we want you to remember, well, we want everyone to remember two things. Well, first, we don't seek to answer all the questions regarding the matter. So, um, because if we do so, we'll have we'll need more than 1.5 hours um, to do this. So we're just going to touch on um our um basic stuff and we'll we'll see what we can handle from there. And then number two, we have indeed studied AI for years. And a number of us are uh, well-versed in both the technical and legal and academic aspects. Um, however, international development, law, uh, sustainability, and AI are very, very broad fields. So um, we do not necessarily declare expertise in all of these matters. And I would actually be skeptical of someone claiming to be an expert in a law which has not been passed yet. So if we're looking for concrete answers or legal advice for your businesses, for um for your enterprises, this might not be necessarily the place for you. But what we're going to do here is understand and identify potential questions that we should ask. We connect topics in a meaningful way. We streamline how the concepts are and how they can be applied so that the ideas are clearer. So that means that it brings us to a richer discussion, not only for academia, because I always also believe, and I I feel that a lot of the people in this room believe that concepts should also should be discussed in a um, greater context of policy making and how it affects ordinary people, not necessarily just lawyers or teachers or um, people within um within these circles. And this is why we asked everyone to join. We wanted to broaden the conversation to more people. We want. We do not want to be an echo chamber of experts or people who have studied this field talking to each other and say we know all about these things when in fact we do not see how it applies to the real world. So related to that though, while we want everyone for their voices to be heard, unfortunately we cannot have everyone speak. So for this, I really apologize. Um, hopefully in the next, in the next um sessions will have more venues for people to speak out. But then right now, what we do have is a Slido. So with the Slido, you can ask your questions there. And at any point, if you have any questions, comments, or whatever, you type it down there. And when the Q&A comes, we'll do our best to raise, up, to raise them up with the speakers. Um, so is that OK? Um, can you give me a thumbs up in the comment section um, below? Well, I don't know where your comment sections are. Uh, yes. So thank you for that. And then, so for my part, well, I'll be discussing three things. So first, I'll introduce the EU AA Act Reading Group in Wakeningen. So how this all started. And then I'll discuss the salient provisions of the EU AI Act. And then lastly, the feedback of the EU AI Act Reading Group. So 
And then afterwards, from the feedback of the EU AI Act reading group, we're going to go with the reactions of different people from different fields, different countries, different perspectives, and see how we can all merge them together to streamline concepts, to ask questions, and to make sure that all the voices, well, not all the voices, but the voices here in this room are heard and seen when it comes to moving forward, not because it is proposed law after all, um, when it comes to understanding and applying this law. So, all right. So just to introduce the EUA Act Working Group, well, what we had, we were in, in Wageningen University and what we had started not only not informal boardrooms and conference tables, but a lot of us are actually PhD students from different fields. We were curious about the EU AI Act. We all applied AI in our work or in different parts um, of our work, and we want to explore how it can impact the landscapes of our different fields. So from environmental economics and law and philosophy, to human nutrition and health, environmental policy, and agricultural biosystems engineering. So Wageningen is a center for sustainability, agriculture, environment, and this is the focus of our university. So this um, curiosity brought seven of us together. So Bart, Kamphorst, Polan, Korenhoff, um, Varsha Kalidas, Luke Stelinga, Idseval, Florian Walters, and myself from several different countries, six different share groups, and three graduate schools. Um, social sciences, VLAG, and PNRC um, to form this group. So we started this project because we wanted to understand and learn from each other's disciplines. Because we understand that when we talk about the application of AI, it's not limited to just one field. It's limit, it's, um, it encompasses everything. So we wanted to look at the AI Act through different disciplinary lenses. We wanted to critically engage the draft, even if it's a draft, and see how it can impact global issues such as human environmental rights, which is uh, my focus, sustainability. Um, I come also from environmental economics and even climate change and looking at it from the perspectives of our various fields. So what we want, what we wanted to have was not only expertise from these different fields um, and experiences, but also diversity. And we bring ideally unique perspectives to the table. Um, so what before we go to how we reacted, so what are the salient provisions of the EU AI Act? What is it necessarily? So the EU AI Act is um, a comprehensive legal framework proposing to regulate the use of artificial intelligence. So it's one of the most comprehensive or touted as one of the most comprehensive in the world. So what they do is they have a risk system. So from minimal to unacceptable risk. So if it's unacceptable risk, um, they are not allowed um, to be uh, employed. But then from minimal, there's a grid graduation of um, regulation that are going to be passed. So it also um, prohibits certain um, applications or certain AI uh, um, certain AI use, it, use cases which they feel would be unacceptable. So for example, if they affect human behavior in a way that humans do not understand or social scoring by the government. Those which are high risk are those um, involving education or critical infrastructures or um, employment, uh, public services, all of these things. Um, and for that, they have stricter policies. So transparency, data quality, um, security measures, all of those things. And the good thing about the EU AI Act is that um, it's not, uh, blanket regulation for all AI. So it's not like, okay, we're banning AI because we know, um, economically speaking, that it's not going to work. Um, so what we do now is we look at the highest risk and then try to regulate the highest risk. And then, and then those with the lowest risk, okay, maybe we can let it go. Maybe we can let the market um, handle itself. Now, um, there comes a question later on on how this actually works, this actually operationalizes, and this is a problem for all policies. Um, how do we make sure that the policies that we're talking about are actually um, operationalizable? Because it might be great on paper. Okay, let's um, let's handle all of these risks, but it might not be good on um, on on in 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 um, in in real life. So 
what the EU did was it basically wanted to establish an EU AI board um, to oversee how these rules are going to be implemented. And it also ideally wanted to support um, AI because it provided for um, regulatory sandboxes, which allows them to test AI within controlled um, within a controlled environment before even going to market. So I feel like a spit comedy now because of the way I speak. Um, so what's important here? Next slide, please. Yes. So what is important here also is that they differentiated between an AI model and an AI system. So the AI model is basically um, core of the AI system, which basically means that um, uh, it's it's a specific part of what a system does, but it's not actually the product. The product refers to the AI system. So um, the focus of um, the EU AI, at least in its multiple drafts, is primarily the AI model, but you can also look at the AI system because the what is going to market normally would be the AI system. And next slide, please. And then, so ideally, again, safety, transparency, accountability, provides provisions for support AI development, et cetera, et cetera. The basic idea of it is that the EU wants to make sure that it is a leading institution when it comes to AI laws and that it will create um, it will create a uh, template for all other countries to follow. So this is known later on as the uh, this is known as the Brussels effect, which we'll discuss in greater detail. But the idea is that, okay, if we set standards, for this group of um, countries, which have very high economic value, which have very high economic power, then it's a possibility that we're going to create a safer AI system for all. So that's the entire premise of um, the entire of, of the EU AI Act. So what we did with the EU AI Act reading group is we looked at all of these provisions and then we read we read them one by one. We met a, a few days every week. Oh, no, a few days a few weeks every month and then we would discuss all of these provisions and see okay how can this affect agriculture how can this affect my field which is law how can this affect etc cetera, etc cetera. and so we we saw a number of questions that we wanted to highlight so first one next slide please is ambiguity so especially in the earlier drafts of the eu act it has a lot of um different um questionable provisions. So they're not necessarily um, negative, but it's just really, as a lawyer, for example, I would, I and then if a, if I am, uh, if a case is brought to me um, and I'm defending an AI company, I would raise a lot of um, questions regarding vagueness because that would, I would say that this would not apply for this particular case or at least for my particular client precisely because it's too vague to apply. And a lot of um, what has been defined in the earlier versions, especially of the EU AI Act, is um, quite vague. So it's a family of algorithms. It's a family of um, software and hardware. Um, a lot of it is very questionable, which makes it um, challenging to apply in real life. So even if the idea was really good, and we support um, regulating AI to as an extent to to a specific extent. The question was, at which point do we really operationalize this? Another question which arose was the exclusion of military AI. So the EU is a, the, the European Commission in particular, looks at the EU market. So beyond that, it does not necessarily have um, its scope of power. You have other bodies for that. But then in the EU AI Act, it excludes the military AI. So AI developed for military purpose is excluded, which of course we can ask um, the EU to regulate, but it's also interesting how they specifically excluded this uh, in, in the EU AI Act. But then what we what we know is that a lot of the developments in AI, the most dangerous ones, for example, drones, are developed under military supervision. And it's very challenging to see how um, or how and when it can go to market, because we also know that a lot of military and space developments 
um, can and will go to market at some future point. So these are questions that we might have to think about when it comes to future, uh, when it comes to the future. Next piece. One of the things that we also talked about is unequal economic consequences. So there are instances when compliance costs could be substantial. This is similar to the GDPR. So the GDPR is the privacy law in um, the EU, and a, a number of a number of companies would have to require uh, would be required to ensure that their that privacy for everyone is being followed. And if you notice in the sign up sheet, I also make sure that. Um, I mentioned the EU GDPR and that we follow EU GDPR rules. Why is that important? Because um, all of us, I mean, if if any person is a citizen of the EU or we're using EU systems, even if we're not living in the EU, the GDPR could be applicable. So this is why it's very important because it's the strictest rule. It's important we follow the strictest rule. The challenge here with strict rules is that we also have compliance costs. And while it's easy for com companies like Microsoft and Meta and all of these uh, huge companies to follow, it be it will be challenging for small and medium-sized um, enterprises to comply or to potentially comply with this. And it might limit innovation um, in these particular areas. So what happens now? There's also the question of the race to the bottom concern. It's also another economic concern. So what happens in a race to the bottom scenario is when a company uh, in, a, in an oppressive econo uh, regime, uh, well, not necessarily oppressive in the sense that uh, Marco, um, sorry, martial law or, uh, or some really difficult situation like that, but rather if we have too many regulations in place, what companies can and will do will move to an area or a country with lesser um, regulations. So now you have these companies, which uh, these countries which look good in paper, but basically the, all the companies which pollute, all the companies which have bad habits and practices, they just move to areas in the globe, uh, normally in the global south, and it harms their populations even more. So the question is, is there going to be a race to the bottom here? So if we put stringent regulations um, for AI in the European Union, is it a possibility that they will move to countries without stringent regulations um, in this particular context? Of course, we can always say that um, oh, well, they still have to follow EU rules if they want, if they want to um, have the EU market base if they want to have EU customers because all of these should apply if you're dealing with the EU. But um, it's going to be interesting to see how um, this would affect uh, this would affect the dynamics between countries from the global north and the global south in this particular context. Are you guys still with me? Okay, yes, I see some nodding heads. Okay, great. So yes, um, you're audible. All right, amazing. Okay, so the next thing that we were talking about was this: is this the best avenue? And this is raised in a recent um, jur uh, the journal, the germ, the German law journal. So this was raised in a recent um, uh, uh, issue of the German law journal as well, because they were saying that okay, the EUA Act is great, but number one, it does not, um, it does not. Uh, necessarily, it might not necessarily be the best avenue to protect human rights or to protect fundamental rights because so the EU is the EU Commission is structured to really deal with the market and the EU AI Act is um is an um, a product of the EU Commission um so now even though the EU Commission pushes for fundamental rights and we see this in the draft of the law. In the actual implementation of this particular policy, of this particular law, it really just focuses on the market. It, um, it can only re re legislate related to market integration, related to safety, but it does not necessarily um, uh, promote human rights. So the question there is that uh, we can be exporting or we can be affected by a law which is... Um, which is good on paper, again, um, which is stringent on paper, 
but then it does not necessarily um, promote human rights in these countries. So for example, uh, to, gi to give a specific example, we could be having a good um, a good law which bans like bad AI. So we follow that particular um, setting in the Philippines or in Bangladesh or in Saudi Arabia or Colombia, for example. Shout out to these countries um, today uh, also who, attend who are attending. Um, but then what happens now is that without the specific context um, of our different countries, then we do not necessarily have, or it might not necessarily be good law because it's not following or, or it's not tailor fit to our specific context. So that's something that we might want to take into account. And also, again, the Brussels effect is very famous. This was a book. Well, this is, a lot has been written about the Brussels effect. The general idea of the Brussels effect is because the EU is a huge market and it's a huge economic power. Um, a lot of companies, especially the bigger companies, will die to serve the EU market because it has um, big spending power. The question now is, um, uh, will it apply to the AI Act? So because the EU is a big spending power, and because taken together, they can create um, their their huge economic, uh, their their economic behemoth. Whatever rules they set in place will affect everyone wanting to serve or cater to the EU market. Now, um, this is where the Brussels side uh, effect comes in. So, because of this, people want even uh, even people slightly dealing with the EU will have to comply with these rules. However, because of this particular um, challenge, it's it's now a question mark whether, because it's focusing only on product safety, it might take into, um, it, 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 it's, it, it might take into um, account, it might not take into account fundamental rights protection, um, which the EU might take for granted, like freedom of speech or all of these things, um, because it's a relatively freer, environment compared to countries like, say, the Philippines or Myanmar or uh, a lot of different countries where these fundamental rights are not necessarily protected. So a lot of these, there are still a lot of other questions um, that we can raise. And I can go on for forever and ever, well, for the whole day, not forever. But what we want to do in this particular session is to ask basically three main questions from what I said, from what they know, from their perspectives, and discuss three things. Um, of course, with everyone in this room sharing their thoughts through the Slido. First, why discuss the EU AI Act in connection with sustainability? I mentioned this a little bit a while ago, but I think we have an uh, an uh, AI and sustainability educator who's been to who's been to two um, conference of parties as the representative of his country together. I think he's a better fit to talk about it from his perspective. Next is why discuss the EU AI Act in connection with other issues of welfare and governance, including people with disabilities and other marginalized groups. So we actually have someone who works on people with disabilities, which is a huge part of our global population. Unfortunately, she could not make it today. Um, but we also have a number of, uh, a lineup of other speakers who talks about governance issues as well, um, who has agreed to join us today also to share his thoughts and reactions on this very important topic. And then lastly, why discuss the EU AI Act in connection with the Global South? And through different lenses. So why is it important to, number one, take it to contextualize the EU AI Act or even any other AI Act? Why is it important to contextualize that and sustainability and through different lenses? Meaning, do we, we take it from a technical perspective, but also from a legal perspective? Again, this is um, a beginning um, a beginning session, hopefully, and we will take more perspectives into account later on. But for today, we're going to focus on these three questions. And without further ado, I will now, in, I, I want to um, invite our speakers, uh, Killian Wood, Angela Santiago, Jamlet Coho Cruz, and um, Ikra, to, it sounds like a superstar, right? Just one name. Um, and Ikra, to share their thoughts on or on, on share their reactions on the EUA Act, sustainability and its impact on the global south. So 
Killian? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening uh, to everyone uh, and esteemed colleagues. Um, so yeah, today we've heard about the 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 A the EU AI Act and the importance of it um, internationally and at the EU level. And I think it's important from even looking at it from an engineering and solution perspective. I think very easily we can just look at finding solutions to problems and that can get you stuck in a one size fits all. But it's important that if we develop something like an EU AI Act, but also how can it be um, used in the global south and, and internationally, it's important that we find ways in which uh, it's it's also able to be applicable locally. So one thing I want to delve into is the nexus of artificial intelligence and sustainability. Um, <clears throat> and also looking at how AI serves as a tool for sustainable for uh, sustainable economic development and also looking at ways in which EU's regulatory framework uh, can also be used in a more international context, uh, such as the Global South. So the first thing I want to start off with is that AI and sustainability is a dual-edged sword. It's um, It seems artificial intelligence stands at the moment as sort of a beacon of hope, um, but at the same time, it's a huge challenge. Uh, we can use it to optimize renewable energy grid, grids, uh, such as decentralized energy systems, uh, in which you can we can make our energy systems more efficient. Uh, for example, storing energy uh, with uh, EVs in the grid or or with uh, different office buildings, which are more energy intensive. Uh, but then there's the other side of AI, which uh, has huge energy demands itself, and basically poses quite significant sustainability challenges and has a very large carbon footprint. Um, so yeah, that's the dual-edged sword I wanted to introduce at first. And then we have the EU AI Act, um, which is, is is not just about the regulation. It, it, as uh, Chad mentioned, it's about setting a global standard for AI. And that's why I think it's so important because, because of the Brussels effect, because of many different effects, if this is really going to be Common global uh, standard. So it's important, and that's why I, I think a good part of the act is the emphasis on transparency and accountability in our AI systems. And uh, that can help in mitigating the environmental impacts of AI technologies. And um, so that's a good aspect of it. So how does uh, the global south come into this? I, I think there's um, there's different challenges and opportunities. For example, there's the deployment of AI in Indian agriculture, uh, which has helped provide farmers with real-time data uh, that can enhance their crop yields and reduce their, their resource use as well, um, which is a huge advantage. And, uh, and I think that's something that should really be pushed uh, with, EU, with the EU AI Act is the the access and equity in these technologies. Um, <clears throat> another thing would be uh, looking at a world in which AI-driven solutions from the global south are leading the way in sustainable development. So take the example of, Ken of Kenya, uh, which is using AI and IoT technologies to monitor and manage water resources, which as we know, is, is a very significant issue. Uh, because of the scarcity of water. Uh, and also more than the scarcity is the scarcity of clean water. So this could significantly improve access to clean water for the global salt. And uh, these examples don't only demonstrate the potential of AI, but also highlight the need for frameworks like the EU AI Act to ensure these technologies are developed and used in a more responsible manner. Um, and then I'd like to also look at um, more of the ethical and policy considerations. Um, so uh, we have to look at ethical AI and, and set a precedent in this EU AI Act uh, so that we look uh, and consider how AI uh, can be used and the projects that it's used in, for example, 
Uh, Brazil has used it in reforestation efforts. Uh, and it's, impor it's important that when we're, we're talking about AI, we're really trying to push principles of fairness, accountability, and sustainability, because there is a dark side to AI, but the, this is what we should be pushing for. So in conclusion, we've looked at the interplay between AI and sustainability uh, in, a, in a very, um, in a condensed way. But what, what I'd like to for us to think about is to realize that we're at a critical juncture. Um, we're at a moment where we can go either way. We could develop technologies <clears throat> which look very good and interesting in an engineering way, but might not be bringing the solutions that we need internationally in the global south, uh, at local levels uh, in different countries, but might actually have more negative impacts. Um, and that's if we really don't push for certain aspects that can really help um, to um, to improve uh, the um, yeah the the way artificial intelligence develops with sustainability. Um, so we really need to embrace examples from across the globe that are currently happening, and make sure that we have an inclusive and sustainable way of harnessing AI's potential. And I do believe that the EU AI Act is a great way uh, for us to do it. Of course, it's got a lot of, of downsides, uh, including a lot of upsides. But uh, as uh, as Chad mentioned, there are issues with it. Um, but yes, it's important that together, now more than ever, we come together, but also we're able to adapt locally uh, to the the challenge of climate change and uh, and create a more equitable equitable world as well. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Gillian. Um, I think what you talked about is very, very important in the sense that we're talking about access, um, access and equity, as well as the different downsides to sustainability when we talk about AI. Um, and now we have uh, Angela. Uh, so we were supposed to have um Janella Pasqual for today because she wanted, um, she she wanted she would have loved to talk about um uh web accessibility because that was her thesis topic next um ah ah yes um she would have loved to talk about sustainability and um and how it affects a, a lot of people from around the world but i think we can reserve that for our next session but today uh we have invited and we we are grateful to angela santiago um uh an engineer a data scientist and a lawyer um, from the University of the Philippines, who will discuss um, his thoughts on um, EU AI sustainability and the global south. Angela, the floor is yours. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, thanks, Chad, for for the invitation. Thanks, everyone, for having for giving me this opportunity to uh, to share with you um, what I what I hope to share. Okay. Anyway, so um. May I request a sharing capability? So I'll just um show a little bit of slides. All right, there you go. So, so I'm going to talk about governance. Okay. And one of the questions that we have to ask is, is there a need to regulate? That's where we start, right? Um uh, we know that AI is the buzzword, and then there are opposing views. Should we regulate AI? If we regulate AI or regulate technology, um, then innovation might be stifled, right? That's one of the arguments against regulating AI. But then again, um, because everyone is into this space right now, I think there has to be some sort of, at the very least, guidelines or frameworks by which we could use um, these technologies. So the EU AI Act is, um, <clears throat> you know, is a good step forward, even though it has um even though it question uh presents some questions no like uh like Chad mentioned earlier um i think it's a good place to start um uh, and for me let me contextualize it in the philippines okay so <clears throat> briefly um technology in the philippines is uh protected under the constitution or, or is um encouraged to be um to be flourished okay um the state shall give priority to science and technology accelerate social progress, 
and promotes human liberation and development. So we see here science and technology as a means or as a tool to promote um, social progress. But then again, um, the questions that are raised with respect to AI, will AI, you know, as, a, as science and technology, will it accelerate social progress? Will it proliferate more inequalities? Or, or what is it really? So these are questions that even us in the Philippines, the legal space, we're trying to figure out an answer. Okay. But we could view technology as uh, property in th threefold. Here in the Philippines, we could look at it as property. So we have laws on property like the Civil Code, 1950s law, the Labor Code, 1974, the Intellectual Property Code, 1997, past 97, and the Indigenous Peoples Rights Act. But then also, our law, um, from doing a, a quick survey, we could also see technology as a means to do good. So through the e-commerce act, the technology uh, the e-commerce act allowed the proliferation of e-commerce in the Philippines, allowed the recognition of electronic documents. When the pandemic arrived, um, courts allowed video conferencing hearings. But at the same time, technology, so it's that's like the reverse flip side of a coin, it could also be a means to do harm. Uh, we have laws preventing anti photo uh, pre preventing photo and video voyeurism cyber crime prevention um harassing people online so safe spaces act and the latest law and one of the few laws specifically mentioning ai in the philippines the anti online sexual abuse and exploitation of children um at this juncture i would like to plot all of them into a timeline Okay, the timeline of the four industrial revolutions. Unfortunately, we do not have time to discuss all of them, but suffice it is to state that the four industrial revolutions, they were pivotal, there are pivotal moments in, in the development of the world. So we had steam, um, the development of steam technologies, electricity, uh, computer age for the third one, and we are at the fourth industrial revolution. And on my part, I will plot the loss that I mentioned earlier. We are here, hereabouts, okay? We are discussing AI, but our laws are just so old. Are just so old. We have civil code regulating property, 1950s. Um, we have the Innovation Act just in 2019. And what I mentioned, the anti-online on sexual abuse and exploitation of children, which prohibited the use of deep fakes to construct pornographic videos, okay? So with all of these, um, there, there are other laws that mention AI, but then they are mostly just aspirational, provide formulate digital technology roadmaps, um, develop modules on the future, um, promote the development of skills. But if you think about it, uh, th these are just, as I mentioned, these are just aspirational. So our laws, we are now looking up or waiting for a law to catch up to tech advancements. And we know that it's a trend th throughout the entire world, right? The tech is advancing rapidly, and then legislation or governance um, policies are just coming after, trying to, um, to catch up. But the big problem that I see here is, uh, with artificial intelligence, is that the development is just so fast, just so rapid. Um, last year, I taught an elective in the University of the Philippines College of Law on AI. A year after, I've included generative AI. <laughs> like within the semester, the, the, I don't know what about next year. I don't know what's going to happen next year. So a lot of advancement is, is happening. And yet our laws are trying to keep up in, if they are even trying to keep up at all. And the so there are a few governance frameworks that I see as bills, but again, they're more aspirational. They want to create inter-council, uh, inter-department councils to, to regulate AI. But the most substantial that I've seen so far is this, protection of labor against AI bill. It's just a bill. So um, basically, the, this is saying that AI, it's okay to use AI to, to enhance labor, but then there should be safeguards, like reportorial requirements. If you're going to retrench someone, um, it, the retrenchment of redundant workforce has to be justified. Um, 
but then um i think this was in response to the uh, the worker strike back in the us so maybe because the the main author is an actor himself but um i i got into a conversation with a friend last night so we were talking about okay let's talk about labor and ai okay there's this bill but then again i think we should look more at the numbers look at um who who are these bills um trying to serve right is there a need to regulate i think yes but we should ask also who are the ones pushing for the regulation as chad mentioned earlier if uh the U, the the passage of the eu ai act basically allows the eu to be an economic superpower right um it allows them to to impose upon certain certain countries um you know if, if you don't right if you don't comply with the eu ai act then i will not trade with you so there are very big implications there so we have to be circumspect in determining who is pushing for these um who is pushing for these bills and then with respect to um the governance oh, oh okay and then with respect to the protection of um certain classes of people so i've mentioned labor this law talked about uh, this bill talked about protecting regular employees against retrenchment but if you will look at the numbers i would like to think or i i think that we have more inform more people in the informal sector than those who are in the formal labor sector so how are they protected if no one lobbies for these people who do not have a voice for the freelancers who are actually in the data and ai economy um it the the regulation the governance aspect will be just lopsided and in favor of a few people so yeah with that i end and i look forward to having more discussions later thanks chad thank you very much angelo this is a uh, super great um it's it's very that's a very good point you raised who are the people pushing for this regulation and i have a follow up question to that later on but we're going to the questions and even more questions panel um later but right now we have m ikra um to talk about how it is in the context of Bangladesh and international law. So we talked about um, sustainability from the global north. We talked about how we do it in the global south or how we could contextualize it in the global south, at least in the context of the Philippines. But from the perspective of international law um, and AI law and also a different country like Bangladesh and a different region because Southeast Asia is also very different from South Asia and the rest of Asia, basically. We all have their different nuances and um, partnerships. So I leave the floor to you, Ikra. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chad, my friend, and and thank you for all other uh, esteemed guests for, you know, attending the session. Uh, my discussion will rather focus on a general perspective uh, on uh, what could be the, you know, negative impacts of uh, this e EU Artificial Intelligence Act. And, uh, you know, there will be some you know lights on 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 you know specific issues uh, in in my country's context and uh, such as the you know resource inequality and exclusionary practices and there are other issues that we you know concern with the more general perspective of this eu ai act so uh, i would rather uh, start with the you know the concept of data sovereignty because you know as you said, whatever EU does, it it will it automatically you know have an impact on the rest of the world because a lot of things are you know one way or another is either you know governed by the you know European Union. So we have this data sovereignty concern si since uh, you know we have we have to you know deal with European Union uh, you know in mostly with regard to the uh, you know diplomatic and and business perspective trade. Uh, is also there. So the EU AI Act may introduce data sovereignty challenges for, for the countries in the global south, uh, such as uh, the compliance may require the you know adherence to European data protection standards, and it will, uh, I guess, potentially limit the autonomy of these nations over their data policies. This is one of the major concerns that I can, I can uh, predict. It will also establish, you know, initial market access barriers because, uh, you know, once you, uh, you know, enact this sort of uh, 
legislation legislation it will basically you know give a shock to the nations especially especially those you know belonging to the you know uh, global south so this stricter regulations will, will definitely create additional hurdles for you know businesses uh, and it will also you know establish some you know potential uh, and, you know barriers in, in terms of economic growth and, and development and regarding the you know international competition uh, in in trade uh, there will be i think a short term imbalance i don't know how far it will be you know stretched out uh, there will be some companies who will be facing this this transition because of this uh, european uh, union artificial intelligence act and these will make it you know uh, un and and unequal you know enforcement because it it will be you know more challenging in regions with weaker governance structure and it will lead to concerns about uh, you know inconsistent implementation and enforcement globally and uh, another concern is uh, it is whatever you know if you look at at the entire text of the uh, you know ai act I, I i i though i think personally that it is it is quite good initiative though it is not it is not uh, you know a perfect time to uh, tell whether it, it is uh, maintaining a you know good standard but we you may argue that the you know sustainability standards you know set by the uh, by the e U european union ai act it, it it will reflect the european standard so it will also neglect the the challenges and opportunities faced by the countries in global south uh, you know ignoring uh, their domestic standards and uh, i would rather uh, you know focus on the innovation aspect as well because uh, the eu act focuses on sustainability so it, it it actually could you know narrow down the process of innovation in the global south you know since uh, there will be new standard uh, standards uh, uh, to be imposed on 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 the uh, you know industrial uh, you know productions so that you know may not align with the diverse needs and capacities of of the different uh, different regions so uh, also you may argue that the eu ai act could you know, inadvertently create barriers from ai developers and, and businesses from global south uh, it will also make them harder you know, very. I mean, to access the European market due to uh, strong regulations, and I find it very hard uh, to consider that uh, uh, if you talk, if we talk about European, uh, you know, perspective, and if we compare my country's, com you know, perspective, there is a visible technological disparity. So, if you are to employ the same, you know, degree of standard on me, uh, I don't think it would be a fair treatment. So uh, since there is a technological disparities, uh, many of the countries belonging to the, uh, you know, global south, uh, I think it would be hard for them to, you know, uh, apply and to employ the same standard, you know, employed in the European Union. So uh, it will it it will definitely create some, you know, unequal treatment. Uh, at the same time, we have you know resource uh, constraints and uh, socioeconomic context. Of course, the contexts are not same in in these two regions so uh it, it will be it will be more like even if you do not have your food on the plate you will have to you know find a plate to you know put it on the table anyway uh because uh, having a plate on the table is is our standard so you'll have to follow that so that is one of the big you know concerns so instead of you know focusing on the resources we are more focused on the you know how the resources to be managed so that is you know it's it's a it's a big 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 concern uh, for me and uh, you know the, i don't know I, I, my personal observation is uh, it will somehow you know narrow down the global competitiveness because the uh, the way we are actually trying to enter in the global uh, market uh, you know sud the sudden you know enactment of this uh, you know this legislation would, will definitely uh, you know you know make us think about the i mean i mean i mean our move next move and and our our possibility to enter in in, in this competition so uh it will definitely hinder the ability of you know south asian business to compete in the uh, european market uh and there comes another concern that is uh, job displacement concern and uh, i was very surprised uh, to know about 
you know, the legislation called Protection of Labor Against AI uh, Bill, uh, as said by Angelo Santiago. I'll definitely, you know, look into it and I'll try to, you know, uh, spread, uh, you know, to my community about this uh, legislation. Because uh, in my country, since we we are highly dependent on the textile market, uh, we 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 are we are you know fearing that uh, uh, you know since the, uh, since the uh, you know exists I mean excessive implementation of AI in in textile market you know in my country it will definitely have have uh, you know positive I mean negative impact on 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 this sector and probably the uh, one of the many uh, sectors uh, who are going to have uh, I mean I mean the fastest uh, I mean they're they're the first to get this uh, you know negative impact on them so this is another aspect it will definitely you know uh, cause some job displacement and um, we are also in the opinion that uh, since ai does not actually i mean eu ai act does not actually include the uh, you know military uh, artificial intelligence these will you know create some sort of imbalance in in in, in different other countries where uh, the political disturbances are highly, you know, uh, dominant. So these will also create another, you know, procedural lapse in, 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 you know, uh, in, in the bigger, bigger spectrum. So I think in total, uh, for us to, you know, comprehend what EU AI uh, would, you know, impact on us, it is, uh, uh, the question would rather be, uh, how can we, you know, get our benefit uh, from 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 this act? But it is it is also a good thing that we are also, uh, you know, seeing some, uh, you know, we can we can we can comprehend some of the disadvantages as well. Uh, so I think uh, the initiative is indeed a good one, but uh, the implement I mean implementation uh, should uh, should be you know. Uh, uh, should not be that you know stringent and should not be uh, that fast so 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 that it it, it affects the lives of uh, you know people of the other countries who are not prepared for it thank you i think that's all from my end okay thank you ikra and uh wow i so i have so many things i want to also say i want to react to the reactions right but unfortunately um uh okay we're going to reserve all of my feelings and all of my reactions to um, the questions and more questions part. Um, but for now, we have Jamlek Coho Cruz um, to discuss from the perspective of human-computer interaction. And he's also um, doing his Master's of Engineering in Artificial Intelligence. So uh, Jamlek, thank you. All right. Um, hi. Everyone, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, thank you, Sir Chad, for uh, the opportunity. So, so before I share my insights on, on the EU AI Act, uh, let me define quickly what is HCI for those who don't know. So HCI, or human-computer interaction, is a multidisciplinary field that involves the design, implementation, and evaluation of interactive systems, especially in the context of the user's tasks and work. And HCI encompasses the design process, which involves understanding users and determining the appropriate design decisions for developing applications, software, or systems. Now, in our HCI course at the Institute of Computer Science at the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, our ultimate goal is to create user-centric designs by applying the design thinking process in our development. Uh, this means that the first step before developing system is to empathize with the users and understand their interactions with the system. And similarly, I believe that the theories and principles we apply in HCI could assist in the EU AI Act in evaluating human AI interactions and achieving human-centered designs. And upon reading the summary of the EU AI Act and doing some reading on some papers on how HCI can impact the design and implementation of the regulations, um, I'm going to share my thoughts on the themes of transparency and human oversight, as well as the challenge posed by ambiguity, as mentioned earlier by uh, Sir Chad and their group, and the use of HCI research to understand context and as a tool in legislation. And finally, I would like to give you an overview of how AI is in the Philippines. Now, in terms of ambiguity, 
um, the, the terms transparency and human oversight are some of the main concerns why AI Act is established. And the problem here is they are underdefined. So for example, if transparency is a more objective interpretation of the quality of the system, what could be their measure to, to measure transparency and also how they measure human oversight? Um, actually, human oversight is more related to human evaluation, which ties to HCI research. Um, the terms are underdefined or ambiguous. For example, they mention about the accuracy and limitations of AI systems. But from the technical point of view, uh, uh, as a student of uh, no, a Master of Engineering in AI, we actually use different metrics in evaluating our AI models. For example, aside from accuracy, uh, some metrics such as F1 score, precision, recall, and other stuff, depending on the goal of the AI model are used. And aside from focusing solely on the requirements of AI systems, I believe we should also consider the creators and users of these systems because they share a responsibility, or should I say an even greater responsibility. Now, for example, uh, since AI involves automation, it is important to distinguish the line between human action and action taken afterwards by AI. So the question now is whether the human operator or developer is still liable or responsible if the AI's system automation results in unethical consequences. Or for instance, if something adverse occurs, is it valid to solely blame the AI system? And similarly, when creating artwork using generative AI, can we credit the art solely to the user? Now, AI employs automation most of the time, which leads to being autonomous. And actually, the, the concept of autonomy is embedded in the definition of rational agents in artificial intelligence. The problem here is AI heavily influences human decision-making, and we need to carefully consider how AI affects human actions, and thus the solution could be the application of HCI theories in, in, in this context. And what am I, um, I, I've been talking about automation. Um, there's a good paper actually that pointed out that there are levels of automation, um, according to Parasuraman and others, which can also guide the assessment of complexity of AI systems and apply necessary rules. Now, for example, we have the recommender systems, which may influence or manipulate your decisions versus evaluative AI, which gives you information or have you control over your decisions, which are based on the information given to by AI. Now, a good question to ask is what level of automation does my AI system have? Because the level of autonomy may be considered in evaluating the risk of AI systems. Since the EU AI Act, um, categorizes the, the risk of the AI systems in the foreground. So for example, you might encounter recommendations on social media platform that initially seem low risk or even no risk at all, but over time, they can gradually influence your lifestyle, choices, decisions, and behaviors. Now going to HCI research, the challenge in HCI research is to continuously study human interaction with AI systems, recognizing that AI is also evolving progressively, similar to what uh, Sir Angela said earlier, that the that, that law should also keep up. And I would say HCI research should, should also keep up with, with the evolution of AI. Now, historically, HCI successfully mastered the comparable challenges, example, uh, when personal computers and the World Wide Web entered the landscape. Now, HCI research suggests understanding and observation of real users in real-world contexts. So this includes uh, universal design and inclusive design. Um, I'd also like to point out that accuracy is not enough to dictate the trustworthiness of an AI system. We should also consider the user experience and its effect on people. Now, given that the trustworthy AI that we want to have should not only be dependent on the task, but it should also be dependent on the context and the user characteristics. And this opens up a new avenue for HCI research to, to really keep up with, with the, the current innovations. And also, I would say HCI research should be an integral part of this legislation. So me as an educator, uh, we can also teach users how to properly use AI systems. They control rather than allowing the AI system to control them. 
And drawing from my experience in agent-based modeling and simulation research, I also recommend maybe we can create simulations of users and their interactions with AI systems based on real-world data, of course. And as an educate, educator, the role of HCI in education is crucial, especially in demystifying AI technologies and how we can foster a safe human-centered AI in the future. Um, it's important to note that a diverse set of users should be considered as well, as mentioned by um, Sir Ikra. And you should really uh, consider the context right, of, of these regulations. And aside from HCI, engineering and law, is it also it is also beneficial to involve other disciplines in evaluating the outcomes of this act. And thus, I'm thankful to have this opportunity to have conversations with people from different fields, and hopefully this is not the last. Now, given the requirements of the EU AI Act, uh, it will inevitably become part of the design process of AI systems. So there is a potential role for HCI in assessing the impact of AI systems on fundamental rights. Um, as Richard Harper said in his paper, we might say the future is not AI. It can only be an AI enabled through HCI. Now, going in the context of the Philippines, now, um, Many experts are alarmed by the increasing volume of disinformation, especially on social media. If I can remember, there is a time actually that a deepfake video of news anchors went viral on social media and garnered a lot of attention. Although the agency promptly debunked the fake video, a majority still believe its content. In terms of economy, many fear that AI will take over their jobs, automating numerous tasks. And even in the field of education, we have observed students using ChatGPT and other generative AI tools leading to issues of plagiarism and cheating. Although there are different departments from the government that have drafted and implemented roadmaps, I think as mentioned by Sir Angelo earlier, um, uh, the Department of Information and Communication Technology stated that the government should intervene and find ways to regulate it, ensuring that AI is beneficial, interoperable, transparent, and accountable. And this is very relevant to the context of the Philippines because in terms of use, the Generative AI Global Interest Report of 2023 revealed that the Philippines has the highest monthly search volume for AI tools overall, with 5,052 per 100,000 population, mostly for text AI. And with this initiative, the University of the Philippines, being the first to offer a PhD in artificial intelligence, has developed the principles for responsible and trustworthy artificial intelligence. And they believe that this shall serve as guardrails for our community and stakeholders. Now, in conclusion, that the EU AI Act could set the tone even for the Global South to do the same. And HCI research can fuel its sustainability. And I hope that this act will not only regulate the use of AI, especially in combating unethical practices, but also foster innovation for a brighter future. I think that's all. And I do have a lot of a list of questions that I could probably ask later on. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jam. Like I, I am I'm so as a nerd, as a nerdy person, I really like talking to fellow nerds about a lot of different things. Um, it's also noteworthy. Um to, to say that um, we have other experts in the room from a lot of different fields. So I think we have people from business administration. Um, we have people from economics. We have people from um, uh, SLIS. Uh, so, I mean, so I think I'm not, I'm not going to, I will go on forever if I will have to name all of this and also the people from different countries. And I'm sure they have a lot of questions in the slide though, already, there are already three questions um, and each one deserves an hour and a half each of, um, of like discussion and everything. Um, I, I just don't know where to begin, honestly, even as a moderator. Um, but so, okay. So now we move on to, a very quick um questions and more questions um uh, uh panel um again uh we have the app uh, the slido event um uh no the slido link so if you have any other questions as well please input the questions in the slido i will put the uh, uh i will put the thingy the the link there we cannot uh, because of the interest of time, we probably won't be able to answer all of the questions. We probably, but then this assures us, at least me, 
that this is just the beginning of more events like this, hopefully. Um, not just for us, but also to a greater audience and we can sit down. And what I was actually thinking a while ago is um, in itself, like for every industry that we talk about, or for even for each context, we can have something related to this. And I'm very, um, and I'm very sure that uh, Yale Global Justice Program and Academics Stand Against Poverty, as well as Wageningen University and the University of the Philippines, um, both CESAM and um, DE would be happy to support us um, in these initiatives. I, I, I just, I'm just assuming, right? I'm hoping. I have my fingers crossed. Um, so now I'm, I'm putting the slide. I'm, I'm putting the slide though here. Uh, so right now, though, uh, if ever we don't get to discuss all of the questions asked, what we can do instead is reserve them for next time, or we can issue like a public statement or whatever. We'll figure things out. But now we have a few more minutes to ask. And one question for all the panelists. Um, how do you think, can we streamline, and um, you can please answer um, as, uh, in, um, in the most, well, in, in the most um, um, concise way possible. Um, what do you think, how do you think can we streamline the EU AI Act and uh, the global, into um, legislation in the global south? Or like, what are the things that we should always remember? You've mentioned some of them. Um, you've mentioned a number of different industries, but we're looking for something really practical, something, um, something, which is a good takeaway, at least for our um, audience today. So we start with um, Jamlek. Yeah, uh, I think based on the perspective of HCI, I think we can do more research on our users. So instead of thinking hypothetical scenarios, why don't we try to, let's say, based on our data, like simulate it, um, utilize the the theories we have in HCI. Right. Okay. So it's it's all about you you feel that this is all about simulation. And I think um well the some some jurisdictions, for example, the US, they're very industry based, no? Um they focus mm -hmm. more on how uh on how different industries would would apply AI and how they would regulate it. So your proposal is maybe instead of just doing it all across, we can do simulations. So I find that interesting, also based from agent-based modeling, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, so like, if we want it to be user-centered or human-centered, we have to really put the, the priority on understanding our user, what the effects of these systems are when it comes to uh, the users. Okay. And um, Ikra, how do you feel about this? Angelo, this feels like a uh, okay. Um, this feels like a recitation class in my in my. This feels like recitation in my classes. Like I, I call on people. Chad, uh, I I my yeah. my 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 internet connection was a bit. You know, uh, uh, it's okay. It's okay. No worries. Your microphone is off, uh, but Angelo. Yeah, I I'll take this. Okay, um, uh, one of the things I observe the most in AI legislation is that they're trying to regulate what AI does, right? The EU AI Act is focused on um <clears throat> unacceptable risks with respect to the use of AI, but for me the the biggest issue or the biggest concern that should be addressed is addressing what happens before there's even AI, right? We know that um, AI relies on algorithms, they rely on data. So we should be able to, to address that the issues there first. So so that um so that that because that's where AI comes in first. I mean, so um if we we fix issues on um, data labeling, for example, because the global south is just a hotbed for cheap labor, right? So, so more than thinking about okay, um, the use of AI in this industry is bad, we have to trace it back to the roots because at the end of the day, there will still be people at the front end of the AI pipeline that will be affected. So that's the one of the first things that we should address, and then, um, 
maybe there will be no problems down the line if the issues in the first place will be addressed hopefully okay, because if so sorry because if you try to just um address the the issues at the end of the pipeline and the issues are still there at the start then we're, we're just like um emptying the ocean with a spoon uh, i i love all of these um affirmations uh you know take it back to the root i love that and also the emptying the ocean with the spoon but it's very true no um going to address the root question of these problems might be able to help address um these questions we have with ai uh, I have a different question for you, Killian. Um, so, and this is coming from the slide, though. Uh, no law is universal in, in scope. How can we encourage the ethical use of AI without relying solely on sanctions and legal restrictions? I think this is also a very fair question because right now we're talking about the law, but then maybe are there other ways or even soft law policies? Um, like what are the pol policies that we can do instead of just relying on stringency? And this is um, Ikra. I hope you you can respond to this as well. So this question is for both of you. Um, but Killian, please. Yeah, I'll give it a go. It's it's a very uh, like you said. It's about an hour and a half question, or it's a million dollar question, as they say. So, although so I agree with Jam like. HCI, HCI is very important, but I think it's important when we look at AI to look at it from various angles. And um, if we're looking at policies, I think it's important to envision a sort of a general purpose technology. So something like ChatGPT seems to be, which is very much a general purpose technology, which has wide ranging effects across uh, industry. Now, if we look at, um, and we think about the AI Act, in a way they've sort of, they could be stifling with innovation uh, as we were talking about, um, as we've mentioned internationally or in the global South. So how would they be stifling with innovation? So they have the AI Act basically classifies uh, AI according to a pyramid of criticality. So there's, they've got stuff which they say is an acceptable uh, risk of AI systems. And that would be something like public authority uh, putting a, uh, a social score on an, an individual and then um, punishing him according to that or, or giving him favorable treatment. Uh, but then this one, which I think is controversial, is the high risk AI systems. So, uh, and then you get limited risk and minimal risk, but high risk is something which is gonna be very regulated. So I think we should have something, uh, policies which will work locally. So have, have a way of defining what high risk AI systems are at a, at a local level. Um, and what I mean by that is making sure that Global South is still able to innovate and come up with technologies. Uh, as uh, as Ikras rightly said, it's not it, it wouldn't be leveling the play field. If this comes, it might be used in a way in which it stifles innovation for certain countries. And we certainly don't want that. Um, so yeah, in terms of equity, that's something which I think is is, is super important. So just to look, I, I came, I managed to look it up. The the definition, the definition they have of high risk AI systems. So they have two, they have A and B. So AI systems that are intended to be used as a safety component of products that are subject to third party blah. So basically, it's looking at um, how it can be used to. Um, how AI can be used in terms of health and safety components and regulation in and of itself, or for example, um, for accepting students in, in a university uh, setting. So imagine AI is accepting university students. So that is a high risk AI system. Um, but, but, but should that be something that we believe is the case for every technology? Is this something which we should maybe be more open-minded about. There could be applications in countries where um, maybe there is a need for an AI to do these tasks. 
that's it's a proposition so really looking at equality and i think it's it's very hard to have an end all answer to that so yeah i'll, I'll pass it on to Ikra. <clears throat> Okay, but I think Iker's connection is bad right now, so we can ask um we can ask it next time. Um, but so oh my gosh, we have more and more questions in the chat. Unfortunately, we only have five minutes. Is it okay for everyone if we take maybe two more minutes over time? I'm sorry, I apologize for the time. Just two more minutes. Basically, what we want to do right now, and uh well, first I want you guys to please applaud our speakers. Um to please applaud our speakers uh, uh, for uh, and our reactors for their amazing insights. But we also want to ask you guys also, um, and uh, in the menti below, um, Carl has put it there, and that I'm going to put it there as well. Can you take one minute of your time, um, or maybe 1.5 minutes because we're running out of time, but I'm giving you more time, to input um your to input your insight into our word cloud so what did you what is the most interesting thing that you've learned today i know it's a lot um but like if you had an insight that you could take away what would it be Okay. Responses. Okay, are you guys typing? So what we'll do with the questions, we have 10 questions now, and I also have people coming in with more questions, is we're gonna post them um, online and we're also going to maybe structure, like combine them together and maybe structure another webinar. If you're interested, we're going to get um, some of uh, the, where we're going to get more people to come in, more people to share, because I'm sure um, the people who are asking also come from a place of knowledge and expertise, probably even more expertise. So, so for example, um, so, so for example, um, public financial management and public enterprise, we could ask them how they think um, this could contribute and maybe from the technical side we can share what we can contribute so it's going to be more of a um, more of a con really a conversation um, and next time we're going to make it two hours um, just to ensure that everyone will have a chance but where is the responses I'm not sure how how this is working ah okay so how do I share my screen um, yes um screen two okay hold on um screen two okay so what what can you see so insights from the session informative inclusive human-centered scalable okay hci perspective ethics um loss in the philippines already but we could offer but they could still be um uh um edited Timely topic um, can be dangerous. Okay, so there's a lot of things that we want that we've learned, and I'm sure there's there's not there's so much more that people are learning. Thank you for filling this up. Now, before we go forward, um, Carl will share the, the 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 screen for the feedback form. So we offer certificates of participation. Um, for for today, um, for all the people who came, but also please, please, please fill it up so that next time we can improve the event. And if you also want, we can invite you again. So again, this um complies with all your personal data will be handled, um, by the EU GDPR. So please save this feedback form, um, and the the feedback form will close one hour after the event. So please, please, please save it, um, because afterwards we will not. Unfortunately, we cannot entertain, um. Uh, uh, giving certificates uh, after this feedback form has closed. Okay, has everyone saved it? Please give me a thumbs up. 
thumbs up. Yes, so I see Do some I have thumbs to fill up. up. The uh, feedback as well. Yes, thank yes. you. Uh, well, no, come on. Well, if you want to fill it up, then you can fill it up. But um for sure we're gonna we're gonna give you um uh something a little something later on. Um so okay. So has everyone saved it? Okay. Going once, going twice, sold. Okay. So um before we end, uh so it's uh, I think 2 a.m. in New York right now. So um both uh, Professor Poge and the uh, Professor Apollo from uh, our uh, from Yale and the uh, Yale Global Justice Program and Academic Stand Against Poverty wanted to come. We also had a person from MIT who also wanted to come as well. Um, and a lot of different people from the US, but unfortunately they cannot come um, because of time constraints. But next time we're gonna set it at a different time so that um, the people from the Philippines will be waking up early instead. Um, uh, or I don't know, we'll, we'll figure out the way. But again, on behalf of everyone, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dean Rico Angkog, uh, 